Um, yeah, and how Bible says that whoever sows sparingly, will he also reap sparingly as well. So give generously, systematically, uh, proportionally, uh, joyfully as a symbol of God's lordship over our finances, over our finances and exercise good stewardship uh, to further God's kingdom. So you could easily do that through Church Center app or our website or text to give, or you can drop a check in our back of our room over there uh, so you could do that. All right, so let me pray for us. Father God, we just thank you so much for all your blessings for us and the ways that you have given us abilities and our minds so that we can contribute to the society and we get paid at the same time. So, Father, we want to be a good stores where we want to sow sparingly and abundantly in the ways that, um, that you will grow in your kingdom, you know, that we're investing in God's kingdom so that kingdom work can be done. Move in our hearts so that we may be like Christ and be a generous, joyful giver. So thank you so much. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so as we have started to this series called Welcome to JCF, uh, and um, we're putting the series on Psalm on hold, and we'll come back to it eventually. So we want to introduce a topic each week to tell you more about how we do church. Right? So last week we talked about kind of the, you know, I wanted to give you a sense of who we are, right? The world may tell us that we're just, you know, losers or like marginalized in our society, but then we know from the word of God that we are not, right? We are royal priesthood, the community of believers. So this week, as I was going to different places, I really felt like I was royal priesthood. You know, I go places, you know, go to Costco, like, hey, you know, but the kingly line is here, you know, and so just, you know, I, I probably didn't do anything different, but at least I felt different, and there was confidence in the ways I walk, but even talking to people, you know, and so there was any priestly duty that I had to do, you know, I was looking out for it, so, you know, so I hope that that is not just something that we learn, but really, right, you know, it flows in our hearts, in, in our lives, right, as we live this life. So I introduced, you know, this um, weekly paradigm shift, right? So last week was of who we are, right? And so I'm, oh, can you try one, one more slide? Yeah. So, you know, so this, this is the today's, um, so there was an introduction, and we're going to have a testimony by Giovanni. Giovanni, can you come up? Yeah, and... Um, and, and today's paradigm shift is that who is the most important people in the church, right? Who is the most important people in the church, right? So I'll have many illustrations, Bible verses, and questions, right? And we'll also have some applications. And after that, we'll have some uh, survey. You know, we did survey last week. And those of you, those of you who didn't the survey, we want to take about four weeks to, to do that. So we get to know you, and you get to know us, and have some kind of connection, Right? And uh, while I do that, we will have some reflection time for you to um, reflect upon the message, right? So Giovanni, come and share your testimony with us. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> it never gets any easier to be up here. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be up here just to get to share a little bit of my testimony. I... Um, I'm grateful to be here. I'm one of the college shepherds. Some of my house church members are here. That's pretty fun. Uh, thank you. I heard random woos. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but I hope you, uh, you all are well. Thank you for uh, coming today. Um, so, for, so, yeah, that's who I am. I'm a college shepherd. I work over here at uh, the local ramen shop for now. Uh, and um, hopefully uh, finishing up seminary sometime soon. Um, <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> 13 days. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, and it's also like coming together. It has to come together somehow. <laughs> whether I want, whether, whether we try or not, it better. Um, so how, how did I become a Christian? Um, you know, God does pursue us. Um, and during my first year at Cal Poly, um, it was a time of transition. It was a time of making new friends. 
And, you know, Cal Poly tries to make friends for you, right? It <laughs> puts you in your college uh, of, like, major, puts you in, like, dorms, and puts you in the WOW groups. It really tries to, like, forge those bonds. Um, but it's not really genuine. It's, it's, it's like strangers meeting for the first time, nothing really linking them. Um, and th for this, for me at least, my first year at, at Cal Poly, I really did feel a little lonely. Um, and God knew that, and he started to surround me with people. Um, I remember um, there was a, a, a Christian friend that he brought into my life. Uh, he was wholesome genuine, gentle, and a total goof. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, and he would invite me to church, but honestly, I didn't grow up Christian. Um, my parents never went to church, and um, so I, I never went. And so I refused to go to church. I thought church is where you go see a father or a priest, and they tell you what to believe, and you have to do it then because you went. Um, and so I, I didn't want to go. Uh, but he, he was still friends with me, tactfully, lovingly, patiently. He continued to share the gospel. I remember one time I was walking by Dexter Lawn. He was sitting there with one of his friends, and he told me, hey, do you know the purpose of Easter? Um, and so, you know, I, I knew a little bit. So I told him, yeah, it's not when Jesus died and came back to life or something like that. Um, I don't know what he was there asking so many people that question. Um, I thought it was random, um, but eventually he was sharing a little bit of, of what the gospel was, and he would invite me to this thing called house church. Now, for me, that seemed a lot more attractive than just some church building. It wasn't some sort of church event. It was him and his friends having food. And so one day, I finally agreed to go with him. <laughs> and it was the day that he forgot there was no house church. <laughs> He said, you know what? It's not house church today. We're actually going to the church sanctuary, and we're doing different stuff. <laughs> so here I go. It was some sort of thing called like a unity night or something. There was like skits. There was body worship. There was, uh, there was songs. It was a wild time. I met the whole church. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. Um, but um, eventually, I did get a chance to uh, go to house church. I met great people, um, they, and, and it was a welcoming, loving community. They genuinely cared for me. There was food. It's one of the many great reasons to go. <laughs> um, and, and the food there by the shepherd was, it was, it was college-like. <laughs> he really did try. Don't get me wrong. He tried his best. <laughs> And, and they helped me serve with food. Uh, they helped me um, uh, participate with them and listen to their Christian discussions, helped me sing songs, their songs, um, and really be part with them. I remember one time we were in a, around a coffee table and we started praying, and they asked me, they asked everyone, why don't we all just go around and just pray to the person to the left? Uh, and for you that know um, Brittany Bland, I was told to pray for her and her prayer list. Um, and so we all gathered there and huddled. Now, I'm a non-Christian, and they're asking me to pray for someone. So I really wanted God to listen. Um, so we go around, and as it goes to my turn, I remember really wanting God to really listen to my cries for her. And I really did sense that God was there with us simply listening and uh, to all our prayer requests. It was a very sweet time. Um, and eventually, people started asking the question, like, are you Christian yet? <laughs> I don't I didn't even, I didn't even know how to answer that. <laughs> Elaine came up to me one Sunday and said, so how are you in your walk with God? And I gave her a strange answer. I don't know what I was saying. Something along the lines, I, it's like I'm drinking a cup and I'm getting more full. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow she talked to my house church and they all started huddling around with me. And they, um, they came together and they genuinely wanted to care for me. They wanted to let me know how important I am to God, how important I am to them. 
They valued me, and I saw that. I saw who their God was. I saw who he was to me and how his story could come into my story. And I committed my life to him because I knew that God cared for me. Amen. And now I serve in this house church. I, and every, anyone that comes into a house church, I also cherish. If they're Christian, I welcome them in. If they're non-Christian, I welcome them in as well. And I really do hope that for those non-Christians that come, they really would see God there in his presence, loving them as well in all that we do. Thank you, everyone. I, I checked uh, Giovanni's feet, and he's still hot, still, you know. You know what that means, right? Yeah, okay. If you don't know, man, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, who is the most important people in the church? Is it the senior pastor, which is me? You know, I, I wish that was the case, you know, uh, or the staff or elders or deacons or members of the church or even a newcomer, you know, some other Christians trying to check out our church and trying to be a member of our church, you know, right? So what is the, right, who is the most important people in the church? But I, but I just want to tell you, um, just from the get-go, the answer is, right, the VIPs, we call it, the very important people, right, very important person. Non-Christians are the most important people in the church, right? And so uh, I'm going to walk you through, like, some of the illustrations, some of the Bible verses, and so this is the paradigm shift that we all want to have. Who is the most important people in the church, right? So give me some sign. Yeah, yeah, right? This is where we're going to go. And you may not agree with me, but I'm going to try to my, my best from all the resources that I have to um, help you to understand that, right? So illustration number one, right? The HSICU. Right? Whenever you see HS in, a, uh, in church, it's called Holy Spirit. It's not high school, right? It's not a high school intensive care unit, right? It's a, a Holy Spirit intensive care unit. If we see church as a Holy Spirit intensive care unit, like a field hospital in a war zone, right? We have all different kinds of patients who are needing uh, treatment, right? If one person have a broken arm or the other one have a you know, GSW, gunshot wound, needing a surgery, right? Who should we treat first, right? I mean, it's no-brainer. We have limited support personnel. We have limited resources. And we all know who we need to tend to first, right? right? I mean, you guys have been to emergency room before. And sometimes you go there, you wait and wait and wait. And even people who came after you get to see the doctor first, Right? That's kind of messed up, right? I thought it was a first come, first serve. Right? No, they don't operate like that. It depends on, I mean, you better hope that if you got something major going on, that you better see it first, right? And so it, we have to kind of understand, right, to know that there are two kinds of people in this world, heaven-bound people versus, right, and hell-bound people, right? And people who have relationship with Jesus Christ, when they die, they will go to heaven. People who do not, right, have a relationship with Jesus, they have not heard the gospel, right, and so when they die, they will go to hell, right, and we want them to hear the gospel, we want them to understand how much God loves them, like Giovanni has shared, so who do we tend first, right, if we are a Holy Spirit intensive care unit, right, so let me give you another example, um, San Luis Obispo uh, population, right, uh, this, this is, you know, in, uh, go along with me, Let's say we have about 50,000 people in our city. And let's say 10% of them are Christians, right? Kind of easy calculation. 5,000 people are Christians. So, you know, and 90% are not Christians, right? 45,000 people are not Christians. So, you know, the 5,000 people, when they, go to, when they die, they will go to heaven, right? And the 45,000 people, when they die, they will go to, you know, Christ, Christless place, right? They go, to, they go to hell. And so, and thinking about that, should we think and do something about these 45,000 people? Amen? Should we do something? I think all church would agree with that, right? Yeah, we should do something about these 45,000 people. How we do church, how we pray, how we use our resources, right? right? How we make programs for our church, 
right? What do we do? Do we, and, and of course we can say abundantly, we have unlimited resources. We do. You know, God is amazing God and, you know, right? He, he owns the cattle and thousand heroes and all that. But in, in practically, when we do things, what is the priority, right? Who is the most important person or people in, in, our, in our church, right? And so, so the bonus is that we have Cal Poly and Cuesta, right? We have every year 6,000 brand new people coming to our city, you know? And out of those 6,000 people, probably 10% are Christians and 90% are not Christians, Right? Brand new people, you know, God just, you know, brings into our place, in our, in, our, in our midst, so that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ. So house church ministry, right, focuses on the 45,000 people, right? They focus on people who do not know Jesus Christ yet. They never grew up in church. They were so, you know, kind of distant from God and distant from church, uh, Right? And so we're interested in sharing the gospel with them, right? Showing them the love of Christ and helping them to see a bigger picture and a better picture of who Jesus is so that they can respond to the gospel, so that they can be saved, so that they can go to heaven when they die, right? And that's what the mission of our church is, right? Mission of our house church ministry is to, right, you know, you know seeking and saving what was lost. You know, and so, you know, going back to question or similar question, like, uh, what about me? When you hear that, like, oh, what about me? I, I thought I was the most important, you know, the member of our church or Christians, right? That, that, that church is, exists to serve the Christians so that we can grow and stuff. And our com- that's a good question, but I will come back to that and answer that a little bit later. But let me ask you a question. That's how Jesus did it, right? And you have a question. I may ask you a question, you know, why did... Why did Jesus come to the earth? Have you ever thought about that? You know, I mean, we know a couple of verses here and there, and maybe some of you guys know Luke 19.10. That's okay. We know that clearly, right? But then uh, going through the whole New Testament and finding every verse that indicates that why Jesus had to come to earth. That would be a pretty interesting project, huh? That's a good book idea, right? Right? Somebody beat you to it. Somebody wrote a book called Why Christ Came. You know, you know? Uh, and, and so in that book, <laughs> right? in that book, he, lists, he identifies 31 reasons in the New Testament for Jesus Christ coming into the world. Right? And the 31 reasons. And I, I, I read them I, about the book. I didn't read the whole book yet. Right? And then, then there's about 20 of them. In the, in the Gospels, right? Because the other epistles are, you know, the church, you know, like leaders, they're writing to churches and things like that. But then in, in the Gospels, right, this is like eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ and they wrote about, there's about 20 of them. Uh, and then there's 12 of them is actually Jesus saying that I have come or I came for this purpose, right? That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Don't you love Jesus? Come on, guys. This is what he said 2,000 years ago, right? He said these things, right? And out of those 12 of them, seven of them are very, like, general characteristics. I am the light. I came for the light. I came to um, uh, fulfill the law, right? Now abolish the law, right? I came, um, you know, uh, what, what else did he say? Uh, I came to give you abundant life, right? Uh, or, 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 right? And, or, or I came as a judgment to do the Father's will, right? And I, I'm the truth. I came to bear witness to the truth. Very, very generic, seven of them. I mean, that's important, but very generic characteristics, I think, right? But five of them are very specific to the gospel, to repentance and dying. And especially this one in Luke 19.10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Right? Jesus, says, Jesus said this. 2,000 years ago, right? And this, it should have some bearing and some meaning to us that he's saying that even just 12 different things that he has came to do, but he's saying that at least one of them, the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. He's the one who's seeking. He's the one who is trying to save these people. And that's why he, Jesus, came, Right? And so, so to me, this, this thing is a very, very important thing, why Jesus is saying that. So even how the first disciples were called, 
You remember that? Right? You know, Matthew 4, 19, it says, Come follow me, Jesus said, that I will make you fishers of men. You know, some of them, I think four of them were fishermen, so they can really understand. Right? But even book of, you know, Luke kind of talks about that, that I, you know, follow me, I will make you a fishers of men. Right? And so when you think about that, okay, what does it mean? So in the ways that from the get-go, from the beginning, Jesus is laying down that what Jesus wants to make us. You know, how as we follow Christ, what we ought to do, what we ought to be doing. Because that is the heart of God. At least that's what I think. But I think you should think like that too. Right? And, and even Great Commission, right? Right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Right? Here, you see four verbs, right? And the main verb is make disciples. The reason you have to kind of know that is because it, this, this, this make disciple is one word in Greek. So you got to say really fast, make disciple. Okay? It's, it's one word. All right? So it's not two words, but it, what is one word. So make disciple. When you read this, right, therefore go make disciple of all nations. Right? And so that's the main verb. That's what Jesus wants us to do before he went to heaven, before he ascended. It's like a, his last will and testament, right? It's more like, this is my dream. This is what my people ought to be doing. Right? That's the main verse. And the three participles, which helps the main verb, is by going and baptizing and teaching. Right? So it's a, how do we make disciple? Disciple doesn't mean just for Christians to grow, but it means both for non-Christians to become Christians, but the, for them to grow. Right? It has two aspects of it. It's not just for Christians. Right? So how do we do that? Go. Why, why do we have to go? Because, you know, there's people out there who do not know Christ yet, who have not heard the gospel yet. So we have to set it, set it up in order for us to share the gospel, right? So then as we share, as the Spirit of God works and they get saved, then what? Then you baptize them, right? So you don't baptize anybody. It's not taking a bath, but you baptize people who are Christians, who become Christians. And you baptize them, then also after that, you teach them to Obey everything, right? Right? You know what everything in Greek means? Everything, right? It means all, oh, everything, right? So you got to teach everything Jesus has commanded you. And surely, I am with you always. So Great Commission even tells us that we have to be mindful of those 45,000 people who do not know Jesus Christ yet, right? And I know evangelism is hard, Right? It is extremely hard, especially nowadays. Right? People have marginalized in some sense, right? But it is hard. And there's, but here's a, there's a Holy Spirit inside living us, right? Giving us that passion, giving us that power for us to be that witness for Jesus Christ. And just look at the general God's heart, right? You know, and you know, there's two verses in the New Testament that reveals that God's heart for the lost Right? For all people, right? First Timothy 2 4 is that who wants all people to be saved, to come to knowledge of the truth. Right? And second Peter 3 9, and he's talking about why isn't Jesus coming back early? Right? You know, because they thought Jesus is gonna come back early. And in that context, what well, Jesus, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understood slowness. Instead, the reason that he's not coming, right, has not come because he is patient with you. Right? Not wanting anyone to perish. Because if Jesus comes, people who do not know Christ, they're going to go to be hellbound. And the reason that Jesus has not come, because he is patient with you, he's giving more time for people to hear and people to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Remember that. Right? And, and I know some of you guys who went to church a long time, oh, pastor is an Armenian. You know? And if you don't know what that means, that's good. You know, we're glad you're here. <laughs> yeah? I'm not an Armenian. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. And if you identify yourself as a Calvinist or Armenian more than you're a Christian, you have an issue. Yeah. I just want to tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we are the body of Jesus Christ, right? And church is the body of Jesus Christ. And he's the head. Right? He controls the body. Right? And if we are the body of Jesus Christ, 
And Jesus lives inside of us in his spirit and continues the work of Christ in our lives. Isn't it fairly accurate to say biblically and spiritually that VIPs are the most important people in the church? Yeah? No? Yes? Yeah? I, I, all those verses, all those thoughts. Right? Biblically and spiritually. It's the Spirit of God. Even the ver- you know, Acts 1 a says, you know, the Spirit is not given for us to, to speaking in tongues. Right? It's not for us to do miracles. What is it for? So that we can be Jesus' witness. It's about witnessing for Christ. It's about sharing the gospel. I know we're very scary, right? We don't know. We don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. But Holy Spirit gives us words, words to say. Yeah. He will remind us the truth. He will work in us, right? And he will give that boldness for us, you know, to be his witnesses all over the world, right? So biblically and spiritually, VIPs are the most important people in the world, right? And so, you know, I want you to know that. And this is the paradigm shift that we want to have and embrace and as a mission of JCF. And, and going back to the question, right, it says, what about me? Yeah, what about me, right? right? It's very, very good, and you know, it's question, and we need to think about that, and yeah, what about Christians, you know? And, but that, the thing is that, how do we grow? How do we grow as a Christian? Right? And guys, going back to the Matthew 4, 19, it says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Right? And I said that many, many times, and I say it again, based on Matthew 4, 19, if Jesus' mission which was seeking and saving what was lost, if that mission is not my mission as a Christian, what does it say about me? You know what I'm saying? He is my Lord and Savior. His mission is to seek and save what was lost. But that's not my mission. What does it say about me? How was my relationship with Him? Is He my Lord? Is He my Savior? Is his spirit living inside of me? Living out, right, the life of Christ inside of me? That's definitely questionable, right? You got to question yourself. Hey, you know what? My Lord, my Savior, the spirit that I embrace and I possess, if that person's desire is to seek and save what was lost, but I have no interest in evangelism. I have no interest in saving the, and seeking and saving the lost. What does it say about me? I may not be a Christian. I may not be a Christian. If Jesus' mission is not the mission of our church, can we say that we are a Christian church? Maybe not, right? If our heartbeat is not with Jesus' heartbeat, which is for the VIPs, are we operating under, right? Different spirit than Jesus or spirit of Jesus? You know what I'm saying? But that's definitely got a question about yourself. Right? You know, Bible gave you so much, uh, so much verses about, you know, how we speak, how we do things. Then what do you get to know? You get to know your heart, right? Through what you say, right? You get to know what's in your heart. And I think definitely knowing that if Jesus' mission is not our mission, we may not be following Jesus Christ. We may be following your own thing, you know? And maybe it may not be the spirit of Jesus living inside of you if you... Your heartbeat is not for the VIPs, you know? Yeah. So I think repentance is in order. We have to change our mind, right? Change our heart. Maybe you thought you just came to just give you a good life, right? Doesn't make you an easy life. That's not what Jesus promised. Jesus promised an abundant life. Jesus promised you a life that is fulfilling, right? That is eternal, Right? That is for that you build and you build up your you know, thing, not on earth, right? But you store the treasure on heaven, not on earth. In heaven, what's left over there? Right? Only people. And God's, you know, God's literally kingdom is going to be there, but only people is going to be there. All the, only the people who are followers of Jesus Christ is going to be over there. Yeah. So my question to you this morning is that can you name... One VIP, sometimes VIP can be a little broad, but can you name one person that you're praying for that who do, did not grow up in church? Do you, do you have one like that? Yeah, yeah, right, amen, right? Hopefully, 
on your house church meetings uh, that you are able to pray for those individuals, right? Because that's what we exist for. They are the most important people in our church, the VIPs who do not know Jesus Christ, right? Amen? Yeah. yeah. So those are very, and if you don't know any VIPs, people who do not grow up church, that, that's an issue for us, right? And I think I've been Christian more than like 30 years. Sometimes you have to work really, really hard to find VIPs. But then it's not really, really hard either because there's 45,000 of them in slow. <laughs> right? 45,000 versus like you know, 5,000. It's a big difference. 45,000 is much easier. Yeah. I think it's our homework. We have a homework in church. Yeah. And if your house church don't have any VIPs that you guys are praying for, you know, I remember when we started our house church ministry and first three years, maybe people didn't really catch the vision, but that, that, you know, subsequent years, you know, we have, you know, shepherds meeting and shepherds would say, oh, pastor, we have a problem. I said, what happened? You know, well, you know pastors like problem is no good, right? You know, we have a problem. I said, what happened? They say, we don't have any VIPs. Like, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a problem. That's right. You know? Yeah, so as we right, do about our work and be mindful of who God is sending us, I got, we got to pray like a oh, Lord, help me lead people, give us divine appointments where we can, who we can reach out to. Right? We, can, we can share the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ with. Right? Give us VIPs. Right? And so help me to meet them. You know? Help me to meet those you know, couple people out of 45,000 people living in slow. So that we can share God's love with them. Yeah. I think this is how God had in mind and how Christians will grow. Christians who is children of God will grow, right? I mean, as a, as a kid, you know, as a parent sometimes, right? Don't you have kids who sees what the father and mother do? And they mimic what you do, right? All the time, you know? Yeah, and that's, so we, as the children of God, we see what the Father is doing. We see the heart of God, right? And shouldn't we mimic what our Heavenly Father is up to? Yeah, that's how children grow in our Father's business. Didn't Jesus say that? Don't you know I must be about my Father's business as a son of God, right? And shouldn't we be the same way as well? Yeah. Uh, we grow to be like Jesus as we work with Jesus in carrying out his mission by the power of the Holy Spirit, loving and partnering with other Christians, by other, other brothers and sisters in your house churches to help the VIPs to experience God's power, experience God's love, and hopefully they will receive Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. You know, we do that by loving and, you know, doing life and going on vacations together, meeting their needs, being a good example for them, influencing them towards Christ, right? So the mission is, is to seek and saving, seeking and saving the lost, catching people for Jesus Christ, right? Witnessing to people to lead them to the Lord. VIPs are the most important people in the church. Yeah. You know, I got saved in 1991. Do you know the very first church class that I took? It wasn't living life. I don't know. This, 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 this pastor, we had, we had we had him for like one year. And he goes, oh, young Su, you say, you know, so we had five people receive Christ with me. And he goes, okay, all you five people, you are in a new class now. It's called CWT, Continual Witness Training. So every week we had to witness to somebody. Man, that was a lot of pressure. Like on Friday night, I'm praying like crazy. Like, Lord, tomorrow's a homework due. You know, like, lead me to somebody, Lord, you know. Yeah, we didn't have house church back there, you know. But yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was hard. Yeah, it, it, is, it is hard. Yeah. So let me, let me give you two scenarios, right? The right, so scenario is that um, what will please Jesus more? Right? Let's say we grew, somehow God gave me a, a, a speaking ability like Francis Chan, and we grew to 1,287 people. You know? Uh, right? But we had zero VIP coming to faith. 
Right? They, you know, when it's all people found out, like, oh, Pastor, you know, Francis Chan is here, you know, Francis McCann, you know, and, and just all of a sudden, there were like, you know, 10 services and whatever we can fit, and we had 12, remember that number, I didn't just get that number from anywhere, right? right? And, and or, we had 135 people, but 13 VIPs came to faith. They didn't grow up in church, they, 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 they got to know the Lord, Every house church, we have 13 of them, 11 in English congregation and two in Korean. And every one of the house churches, they reached out to somebody. And by the end of the year, right, every one of them received Christ. And it grew by 13 people. Right? Yeah. Which one would Jesus be glad me more? Right? Which one? Yeah. Second one, right? Heck yeah! 13 times over, I take that. Right? 13 times over, we take that. Right? Because the Bible says that there will be more rejoicing. It's not that he's not rejoicing over those 99 who, got, who is already righteous, who don't need to repentance. Right? He's overly joy with us, right? right? I told that last week. Right? Don't, don't beat yourself down like, oh, I suck. You know, I'm not evangelizing anybody. No, don't think like that. Right? He, says, he says there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So the 12, 12, 87, I got that 99 times 13. Yeah. So, you know, right? 13 versus 12, 87, right? Or whatever number that is, right? Jesus will be more rejoicing over those 13 and how we are doing church, how we want to be focused about them, right? So this is how we envision the growth of JCF. Yeah, and even when we are building this, you know, expanding our, our building, we says, yeah, those empty seats that we're going to have, we want to fill it with the VIPs for them to grow, for them to know Christ, that we be the agent of God in order for them to experience God. And, you know, yeah, you know, like we want them to come to our church, but if they go to some other church, that's fine too. But then we want to focus on the VIPs and for them to experience God's grace and God's love and if you are a Christian and somehow Lord led you here, we're glad you're here, right? And you're glad you're here and checking out our church. And some other of you uh, uh, are already Christians and you have moved to this area and have come to check out our church. And, and we're glad you're here as well, right? We're so glad you're here and checking out our church, right? We want you to, uh, we want to share with you of our convictions, that's what we want to do. That's why we call it Welcome to JCF. We don't want you to come and see how we do church and like, oh, this is not like normal church. And we're not normal church. You know, you know and th- you know, this is like what they said or what they heard, what people heard, right? And, and that's not how they do church, right? Because we want you to know through our paradigm shift today, the VIPs are the most important people in the, in the church. And we want you to know that. I want you to understand that. And later when we do things, you look at it from that lens. Oh, VIPs are most important. This is why we do, uh, do this way and stuff like that, right? You know, so, and, and if you just found out today, yeah, you know, uh, it's like, oh, that this is what their church is for. You know, if you don't agree with that, we're perfectly okay with that. We still love you, you know, and we want you to know that this is why we do this series, and this is how we do our church. And if you don't agree with us, then you probably won't be very happy with us because we probably won't do the things that, you know, you want us to do, right? So we want you to know why we do certain things, and you're more than welcome to check out other churches in town, right? But we recommend some, you know, uh, some other churches that you may be super happy, but if you are new with us and you know what our convictions are and the mission of our JCF, right? And as you know, the conviction of my heart and conviction of our leadership's heart, and there is a way for you to embrace this conviction, right? And follow proper biblical steps, right? In order for you to become members humbly and submissively to do that, right? And, you know, but I just want to be very frank with you, very, very clear with you. This is the mission of our church. This is how we want to do church. And I'm not saying we're perfect. Yeah. In fact, we're very immature. We are. Yeah, yeah. I don't know any other church except this one because I got saved in here, you know. And, 
we, we are far from perfection. We have a long way to go. And we are, right, we have many, many, many growth areas, right? But by the grace of God, we have taken some right steps, right? And we have grown, and we are certain that God is with us. God is working, that God has blessed us. And Lord Jesus is very pleased with us in the ways that VIPs are the most important people at JCF. Uh, and, and we are really glad that when VIPs come to our house churches, man, we rejoice. Yeah, we, we are so happy. So, you know, uh, you know, looking forward to that person right, coming to faith. And right, when, when they come to our Sunday service, you know, we want to help them and as much as we can. And um, right, for them to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Whether you are a college student or post college or no college or whatever you are, yeah, you know, right? You know, you know, do not have a if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We're so glad that you're here this morning, and we're we are here to serve you and help you in your in your journey with Jesus Christ. Yeah, and so if you are you know college students, we have a special thing for you. Yeah, and I I think it's so special time as a college student that you know that 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 you are saved and we want you to see the college campus as a mission field. God didn't just send here for you to just get a degree. Yeah, degree is nice, right? But just to walk with God, right? And, and work with God and, and, and really do the things that God wants you to see and how God looks at and give you the vision that you look at the field. What do you see? Oh, I see a 4.0. Oh, I see my degree. I see my $100,000 that I'm going to get when I graduate. No, the, the, the field, right? The harvest is plentiful. That's what God wants you to see. Yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's a 20,000 people there. The harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Right? And ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers right? in order to work with God and in order to experience the, 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 the growth and the fullness of God, that what God is up to, what God wants us to do. And know the mission. Mission is not for you to graduate and get a $100,000 job. The mission is seeking and saving the lost, catching the vision, catching people for Jesus Christ, witnessing people and leading them to the Lord. The same work. Jesus did on earth, right? You know, going back to those powerful verses in the Bible, right? Yeah, same work that Jesus did. And we want to partner with college students, right, who understand that their college campus life is a, right, is a missional life. Your college campus is the mission field that we want to support you and as best as we can. And that's why I want to pro provide clarity to you. We have to be very clear, right? You know, and in this series, I was thinking about, yeah, I want to provide clarity. I want to provide movement. I want to provide alignment and focus. Yeah. yeah. And I want to provide clarity. And the mission for us is to seek and save what was lost. VIPs are the most important people in our church. And we want to grow our church by evangelizing. Evangelizing the non-Christians. Not stealing from sheep from other people, other churches. You know, and so we say, oh, look at us. We have 1,287 people. None of them got saved here. I'll be really, really sad. You know? Yeah. And so we want to grow through VIPs who do not know Jesus Christ. We want that 45,000 people to experience the love of God. Yeah. Biblically and spiritually. Right? For us to experience this desire of our Lord. Right? And grow in that. Right? Are we clear? Are we clear? Nobody's saying Crystal? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are we clear? I want to provide that. I, I, I don't do a really good job, you know, sometimes. But, yeah, I want to be very, very clear that VIPs are most important people. Yeah, and if you're VIP, yeah, we're, we welcome you here. We're so glad that you're here, right? And, and you know, as a house church, um, oh, no, that's my, I'm almost done now. Yeah, uh, application point, right? And so the thing is that I want to be very clear that VIPs are the most important people in the church. Right? Do you get that? You know, I'm not saying other people are not important. The most important we're talking about, right? Get the spirit, please. Right? Bible says, you know, without the spirit, letter kills. But the spirit gives life. And we want to share that kind of life with one another. Right? You know, so most important people in the church. And if you are a VIP, know that, that you're glad that you're here. Know that you're welcomed here. 
And he wants you to grow here in your spiritual journey. Right? And the third point is that, you know, yeah, be a good, good house church member. And this is what they are for. That we want to seek out, right, the non-Christians and for them to experience God's love. And, you know, and also be a good house church member not just means that, oh, I got to bring more VIP. Yeah, true, that too. But then how would they experience God's love? Not just the way that we love them, but how we love one another. Yeah. You knew, you knew parents, how important it is for you, you, husband and wife, to love together. How your kid will know how much your parents, your, your parents will love me is being modeled how the mom and dad love each other. That's why sometimes we're kind of messed up. Because if we know our parents love us, but because their love is a little bit kind of skewed, uh, then we don't really understand uh, how much our parents love us. Right? Our priority is to really love, you know, you know right? love your husband and your, your wife. Right? And that's what it means that how we need to love our house church members. Love your shepherds, right? And love your, you know, even VIPs do come. You need to love them as well. Right? And it's not just the shepherds who do all the work either. It's, it's, it's a group project. It's a group effort, you know, doing this work together. Because, you know, right? You, you know, if you were saved, Christ's spirit living inside of us. And we've got to be about that work as well. Right? And so be a good church member. Be a good, you know, house church member. And experience love of God together. And house church loving VIP well, as, uh, VIP well as well too. Right? You know, for them to experience God. In that sense. Yeah. And like I said, church is a, you know, church is the hope of the world. Can you imagine one person, like kind of really bad person in this world? Right? Like, I, I guess we can all agree like Nazis, Nazis were kind of, right? Hitler was bad. Just imagine somebody would have reached out to him with the good news of Jesus Christ. If that person experienced genuine, genuine conversion, it would have saved a lot of people. Right? Right? Same thing. Kim Jong-un, and North Korea, Putin, or whatever it is, you know? You know I wasn't going to put some more politician names in there, but I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on which side you are. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. What do we need? Right? Church to do their function, to seek and say what is lost, for them to experience God's love, for them to experience transformation and live like Christ. Then church will become the hope of the world. Yeah. Uh, I have so much more to say, but Denise, you know, I kind of said like, you know, I kind of lie sometimes, you know, being a short message, but I tried really hard. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Pastor, for, I feel like it was super convicting. I'm just like, oh, my heart is just like beating. Um <laughs> Um, so, as uh, Pastor mentioned earlier, um, we are doing the survey. Uh, sorry, I'm a little emotional. The survey was really good. <laughs> um, yeah, so we want to do the survey as a way for us to kind of connect more with you all and to just kind of see who is in our body, who is coming to church on Sundays, and just to, so we can better care for you guys. And our hope is that with all the information that you guys fill out in the survey, we can hopefully reach out to you all more and know better how to pray for our church as our church continues to grow. So with that, um, we did do the same survey last week, so we are going to do the survey for the next couple of weeks. So if you can go to the next slide. We have our QR code that you can scan to do the survey. So if you did the survey last week, you don't have to do the survey again. Um, and if you didn't, if you haven't done the survey, <laughs> please scan the QR code, or you can also go to our website at journeyslow.org. If you have the Church Center app, you can also log in the Church Center app. And if you would prefer to fill out a physical copy, if you can raise your hand, we have some physical copies that we can hand out as well. So if anyone would like a physical copy, please raise your hand nice and high. And we will deliver that to you guys. So I'll give us about like maybe like three to four minutes to fill out the survey. And um, and for those of us who's already filled the survey, I really want to invite you guys to really reflect about the VIPs in our lives, especially if like some, like me, my whole family, they're VIPs, and use this time to pray for them. Um, and if you don't know any VIPs, like ask God to really bring VIPs into your lives so that you can share this good news with them. And if you are someone who identifies as a VIP, um, 
Just know that God really loves you. And he wants you to know him. So we'll pass out the survey, and I'll come back here in a few minutes for us to fill it out. Yeah, go ahead and fill out the keep filling it out and I, I I just have one more minute thing to say. You know, whenever we read Luke 15, the story of prodigal son, you know, we always talk about the older brother, right? Knowing if he knew the father's heart, right, would he be just going into farming just to work? Would he do that? Right? I mean they had to hire people to do it. What, 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 while father is a long way off, Bible says, waiting for the prodigal son to come back, what would the older son would be doing, right? I think about that all the time. Yeah, you know. If he knew the father's heart, what would he be doing? Yeah. Maybe go to the you know, younger son, younger, younger brother, right? Or waiting... For the brother to come back with the father, uh, right? Can I say like, wow? But you know, our older brother didn't do that. Our older brother came. Our older brother, Jesus Christ, came. He gave up heaven, and he came, and he died on the cross. He died a death of a criminal to pay the debt that, that I owed so that we can be forgiven of our sins and given a brand new life in him as our as God's children. And we have younger brothers. Let's do 